Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and it's episode number 206 of Goulet Q&A and it's going to be a good one today. I'm just, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it's going to be good. Um, I'm going to try to keep the intro portion a little shorter this time. I went a little long last couple of times, got some feedback. Not that I really, you know, can cut myself that short <laughs> or that uh, I want to cut it out completely because I know a lot of you like the intro and like to know what's going on week to week, but I don't need to do like a 18 minute intro like I've done on some other ones. So uh, a couple things that have been up recently, we finally got the new Edison Nouveau Premier for spring of 2018 up, Purple Rain. And uh, this particular one I wanted to show because um, it has way more color or way more um, swirl to it than what we have photographed. So what we have photographed is kind of on the normalized end or maybe slightly less swirly end. This one is like the most intense of the swirls, which is what I kept for myself. So um, anyway, it gives you an idea of what you might be looking at. It is a deep purple swirl with pearlescence and it has a white kind of swirliness happening in uh, kind of the pattern there. So this gives you an idea of like on the extreme end of the white swirl of what you might see. And then if you look on our website, it has a lot more purple to it. So you're gonna get somewhere in between there. And of course, where there's more white swirl, you're gonna see uh, kind of a lighter purple color. So we have those now. Uh, well, okay, sorry, we released them. They sold out over the weekend, last weekend, and we're getting more, and uh, basically we're gonna be getting them, uh, you know, as Edison is making them. So we're, we're gonna be getting them in smaller quantities more frequently than what we've done in the past, but even still, we're just, uh, we're at the mercy of their production. I know they're working hard, uh, but we'll have them back when we have them. So sign up for the email notification list if you're interested in that. But anyway, that's what we got going on now. Uh, what else have I got? The um, Conklin Duragraph Red Knights, uh, which is, you know, similar to all the other Duragraphs with the black accents and things as such, but the body is a bright red. So originally they were coming out with the Purple Knights and then they had the Red Knights. Uh, and this is so a same pen, same kind of, um, uh, what's it called, quartzy kind of pattern to it, pebble, you know, what are we are going to call it, uh, flecked look, uh, but it's a, a bright red. And red, you know, red pens are like kind of touch and go for some people. Sometimes red pens do okay for us. Sometimes they really, really don't. Uh, but this red seems to be pretty well received. So, um, and it's a relatively affordable pen. I think it's a great deal for the quality pen that it is. So it's definitely worth a look. Um, we have some something new from Pilot, which is always exciting. Two new colors of the Vanishing Point Decimo, which is um, a lighter, thinner version of the Vanishing point it uses the same nib uh, and feed and everything so it's the same nib unit you can swap between the vanishing points uh, but two new colors you maybe not like earth shattering colors for you uh, but they have it in black and a navy which the navy to me really pops it kind of like blends in with the back of my wall um, and of course I'm a fan of blue so I would say that but the navy really is kind of awesome it's got a little bit of a pearlescent kind of look to it if you're familiar with the stargazers at all it's kind of like that look the black is pretty much a straight black um, but the blue has a little bit of pearlescence a little bit of shininess to it so you can check those out we have those available in multiple nib sizes what else have we got let's see um Oh, I gotta show you this. Okay, so we are doing a giveaway, which is uh, happening right now through Wednesday of next week. This is one that we've collaborated with um, uh, Jake Weidman, who of course, I'm a huge fan of his work, uh, but we are doing a Monta Grappa blazer giveaway. So it's the blazer pen, which is this steel fired pen, and it has this crazy pattern. This is the actual pen we're giving away. And uh, what nib size is this? Uh, this is a fine nib. I'm not sure if we'll have the ability to swap that. I don't see why not. But anyway, this is a fine nib. Um, it's a steel Yobo nib, which writes really phenomenally, uh, I must admit. I like that they are making the switch um, over to Yobo because I really like the way they write. And uh, the, it's got this cool fired look. It comes with the mug as well, which I'm not going to unpackage it and show you that, but you can check it on the website. And the cool thing about this is we worked with Jake to do a giveaway of this art print of his, which is Consuming Fire, uh, which is this sweet lion uh, with mane of flames. And, you know, I have a couple of Jake's pieces of art of just some of his drawing. Uh, this is the first piece of his art that I've seen that's in color. And it is, like, not only is the artwork itself 
incredible, but like the black is like staring into a black hole. It's like so dark. Just the contrast and the, the colors that just pop, like it's clear that this is like just a quality like you don't see many places. So uh, I'm severely impressed with the quality of this color print, which is the first I've seen from Jake. And then of course the color of the fire and everything. It's just the detail on it is phenomenal. And I'm such a Jake fanboy. I'm not gonna keep gushing because it's, I'm gonna start blushing here, but um, really good stuff. That print is a 12 by 12 and he sells it for a hundred bucks on his site, but it's being included in the giveaway with the pen. So all together, it's like a $500 value basically um, for these two things. So it's pretty sweet uh, and you could win that if you just wanna to go to gillypens.com slash giveaways and you should be able to check out how to enter there. It's pretty cool. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can, you can uh, join our giveaways by signing up for Instagram and um, YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, so I recommend that you go do that because why the heck not? You can win these sweet things. Um, and then one other thing, this isn't product related, but um, finally working on our last video from visiting Lamy back in December of last year. Um, we're doing like a, if you're familiar with the show, How It's Made, doing like factory tours and stuff like that. Uh, I very much shot a video in that style. Andy and I collaborate on this one. This was the most time consuming of the videos that we did for Lamy because you know, it's basically all this close up footage of the machines. And it was really like hard to like get all the right footage and then come back and compile it all together. Especially Andy's been, you know, I think she'd been working here maybe two weeks at the time I went to go shoot this. She just came back, she doesn't even know like what a fountain pen is. And I'm like, look at all these machines. And she's like, mm, okay, you know? And <laughs> so it's taken a lot of time for us to do the other videos we had in the works already, but then to sort through all this footage, tell it into a compelling kind of story. Uh, and I think you're really gonna like it. So that should be super cool. Mad props to the Lamy folks for letting us shoot that. Basically, we've got the video done. We just had to send it off to them to make sure, because there's all this like proprietary stuff that they've developed to make sure that we're not showing anything that we shouldn't show. So we're waiting for them in the review process. Once we hear back, we're gonna look to schedule that maybe in the next week or two, depending on how quick, quickly they get back to us. So pumped for that. And then we'll be all good for the Lamy videos. That'll be the kind of the final one from that trip. All right. Let's get into the questions for this week. First one I have is from West Castle on Instagram. Oh, actually no. West Castle, you're gonna have to wait a minute. Uh, I meant to prep this a little differently, but then I totally forgot. So uh, one of the questions I'm gonna take, actually move it right to the front, um, which is from Cushing.Ethan on Instagram. And the question was, know any good fountain pen jokes? Um, so there were a couple that I had, most of the fountain pen jokes are either just straight up puns or uh, quite frankly are just very inappropriate adult humor. Uh, I don't know what it is about fountain pen terminology, um, but uh, I won't even say any of them because I think you probably, your mind is just goes right there. But um, anyway, try to keep it as family friendly here. So there's a number of different terms that could be used to describe uh, rather adult themes. So um, didn't wanna go in anywhere there. So I'm a huge fan of dad jokes, partly because I'm a dad and my kids are at the age where dad jokes are actually funny to them. So I'm just like loving life right now uh, in this phase. My kids are six and eight. So just like, you know, if they're say like, I'm hungry, I'm like, oh, hey, hungry, I'm dad. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, love it, I just absolutely love it. It, might, it cracks my kids up. Uh, so I kind of adapted a bunch of those and made them into fountain pen jokes. So that's what we're gonna do here today. So what I'm gonna do, I, I ended up spit staying up way too late last night coming up with like 18 or 20 of these things. So I'm gonna kind of like sprinkle them throughout the Q&A today. A little special treat for you all. Um, so this will kind of be the first one. I'll kick it off with a few. Uh, and then I'm going to um, kind of tell you some more uh, throughout the whole thing. But I like put my notes in a separate place. So I'm gonna have to flip back and forth. So you'll have to give me a hot second. I meant to like really work this in there. Um, okay, let me pull up my notes. I like have a whole separate spreadsheet where I kept all the jokes. Here we go. Okay, we're gonna make this happen today. Cool. All right, beautiful, beautiful. Sorry, give me a second. We're getting there. It's worth it, I promise. Well, maybe not. <laughs> All right. All right. We're getting there. 
Sweet. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a few right now, and then we're going to sprinkle them out throughout the rest of them. Um, so uh, first one, what newspaper does a fountain pen read? The New York Times. <laughs> Love it. It's weird being like by myself in front of a camera because I have to like laugh at my own joke. I'm just imagining how much you're like laughing with all of these. Okay. Uh, two fountain pens walked into a bar. The third one ducked. I'll just let that land. Okay. You want to hear about joke about paper? Never mind. It's terrible. I'm really cracking myself over here. Um, I heard that Lamy was going to develop a new Velcro pen, but they thought it might get ripped off. Yeah. Okay, I'm imagining you're just like bowled over uh, right now in laughter. So I'm going to sprinkle the other jokes I have throughout the rest of the questions. Okay. Going back to my original first question, which is from West Castle on Instagram. I saw your video about cleaning new Lamy pens because they were inked for testing, but is that true for all manufacturers? Should you always clean new pens before first use? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, it's something that basically every manufacturer recommends that you do, just kind of as a common practice. Um, and I, I think it's a good practice too. Do I always do it? No, because half the time I'm excited about a new pen and I just wanna ink it up and get going. Uh, and it's not necessarily like super critical required for every pen reason most manufacturers put it in there is because there is a possibility there could be some machining oils or a little piece of schmutz or something in there that isn't supposed to be there but that will wash out and clean out and all that kind of stuff. Most manufacturers are cleaning out the pens and stuff like that but it's still a good practice just to clean it out for the first time. I don't you know I think honestly if you're involved enough in this hobby where you're sitting here watching uh, however long, hour long video of me talking about pens, you're probably invested enough into it where I can let you know on the down low. So like, yes, okay, the official stance is you should clean out your pens always with every time and you should, you know, use the ink that the manufacturer recommends and you should, you know, always do everything properly. Me as a fountain pen enthusiast, I'm like, just use it to your best, like educate yourself, use them however the heck you want, hack it up, do as many different things as you want to do, just understand like what the manufacturer recommends and what you should be doing. Okay, cool. So um, as far as cleaning the pen goes, it's always a good idea to clean it. Really, that's just in case you have a flow issue or in case you have something where it's not living up to your expectations inking it for the first time. If you haven't cleaned it out, then that's like one variable to your, your challenge. Is that always going to be a problem? No, not really. But um, so that's kind of the approach that I take is I always just, I mean, not always, sometimes I'll clean up the pen, but I'll usually just ink up the pen and get really excited and kind of go with it. If I'm having something that's different than what I'm expecting, then cleaning out the pen is one of the first steps that I do. And then some of the times that will actually just eliminate the problem, usually if it's a flow issue. Uh, and then other times it won't. And then you know that that's one thing you don't have to worry about. So it really is up to you. The reason I do it that way is because I'm getting new pens basically all the time. So I kind of know what to expect from which manufacturer and stuff like that um, and, and how pens should write and all that. So I know kind of what I'm, but if you are like, I want to play it safe, I only buy two pens a year or something like that, just go ahead and clean it out. It takes like two minutes and then you know you don't have to worry about it. Uh, with Lamy specifically though, so they test, they write test all their pens and you'll see this with the Lamy video that I'm gonna have coming out here pretty soon, um, but they actually ink up every single pen and then write with it with Lamy Blue Ink um, but there's a little bit of ink left in that pen and it kind of dries in there. So it's got like a blue kind of haze on the feed and uh, just flushing it with water. You don't even need to go crazy with it. Um, you can basically, if you use the blue cartridge or use Lamy Blue Ink or whatever, that's fine. Like you don't, I guess you know, technically don't have to clean it. You can just go. And I think that's kind of why they design it that way. They include the blue cartridge. I think the majority of people using Lamy pens, especially in Germany, they use cartridges. Like that's just way more common for them. So uh, I think it's, it's not as big of a concern. And I've never really heard of any issue with people who like haven't cleaned out their Lamy pen and then it's like this huge scandal of using it. But you know, there's a little bit of ink left in there so you just wanna clean it out before you get to using it again. Um, other manufacturers, I can't name another one who 
uh, has that much ink left in the pen after it's uh, been manufactured like that. I think that's kind of a unique to Lamy thing. It's just extra steps to clean. I guess, I don't know, hasn't been a problem. I've been selling Lamy for seven years and it's never really been a problem. It's just something you gotta be aware. I did a video on it like years ago about cleaning it out probably six and a half years ago. Like as soon as I noticed that that was a thing, I was like, that's weird. I'll just clean it out and it's perfectly fine. Um, other manufacturers, they do test the pens and stuff like that, but I guess they have additional steps or they test it in a different way where um, it doesn't get it all inky and stuff like that. So um, it, I, it's you have gotta be more diligent about it, I guess, with Lamy than you do with others. And be aware that if you're having flow issues or something, you gotta do it. Um, but otherwise, I don't you know, really think you have to sweat it all that much, but it's still a good practice. All right. Let's get a couple more jokes in here, shall we? Um, I used to get a small shock whenever I touched my pens. I don't anymore though. Needless to say, I'm ecstatic. All right, okay. Did you hear about the new anti-gravity pen? It's impossible to grab one. And why wasn't the fountain pen popular on Instagram? It just wouldn't post. All right. I'm digging this. I had a lot of fun putting these together, by the way. I looked at so many dad joke websites, just the best. All right, this next question is from Romeo RV1, RV1 on Instagram. Uh, which of your fountain pens get the most attention from non fountain pen people? So, like normal people. Okay, um, <laughs> I think pretty much anything like with interesting colors, materials, you know, fountain pens themselves. Okay, yeah, you can have some fountain pens, but like most people are familiar with, you know, like a, a click like G2 or a Bic stick or something like that. Um, if you have any kind of fancier pen, like even thinking back before I was into fountain pens, when I was making rollerball pens out of wood and stuff like that, fountain pen or not, just any like nicer pen uh, gets attention. Uh, but the fact that it's the fountain pen is like even more super interesting, right? So some of the pens that I'm carrying around these days uh, that do tend to get some attention, uh, Twisby gets a lot of attention, I think because the demonstrator aspect of it, when you can see kind of what's going on, you know, it's like you got the Twisby Eco uh, 580 all here. This is an Eco T that I have inked up, uh, especially when like you pull out a pen and you're writing with it, you're seeing the nib, it's clear, the ink is sloshing around, you got colors, you know, and stuff like that. That gets people's attention and they're like, whoa, what is that? And I think Twisby 2 is like, it looks clean, but it's not like super ornate. Same with Lamy, same with some of these other ones that are like, they're they're nice looking, but they're not like so, so fancy looking that it intimidates people. You know, you have something like a blazer and people are just like, what is even happening here? They're like, they don't even want to touch it because it looks expensive, right? Which is part of the part of the appeal, I guess. Um, or you have like a Mont Blanc or something like a brand that people recognize that is expensive. Um, it's a little bit more intimidating. So actually I find like there's kind of like a threshold, like a wall that people hit between like, hey, this is nice, but kind of accessible. Can I touch it? Can I look at it? Versus like, hey, that's really nice. Like sort of like if you see like a Ferrari driving down the road, you're like, whoa, that's really nice, but I don't want to touch that thing because I don't want to break it. You know, it's like that kind of thing. Or it's like, man, I don't know, maybe you're maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're like, heck yeah, I want to drive that thing. Uh, it could be that way too, but I think most people would be like afraid of it because it's so expensive. Um, I think most people feel that way. Maybe even about a Twisby, like, like $30 for a pen, that's insane. Some people are like that and that's totally cool. You know, it's like we pen people to get super into it and we're like, oh, $30, what a deal, you know, as opposed to like, oh, homo sapiens, oh, okay, $700, yeah, yeah, okay, that's an expensive pen. Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like when you first get into the hobby, you're like $30, whoa, like that's crazy. And then like two years down the road, you're like $250, that's crazy. And then three years down the road, you're like, $700, that's crazy, but 250, oh dang, that's a good pen. You know, it's like, that's how it goes, right? Any any niche hobby that you get into, you kind of go down these rabbit holes, right? Uh, but anyway, so I've been carrying around things like Twisby's. I always like to carry some more affordable pens, like either Twisby's, Pilot Metropolitan, it always gets a pretty good response, especially with the colors. Ah, uh, oh, mine's being cleaned right now, dang. But uh, still, I have to carry like the turquoise one around all the time. That one gets really good. The purple one uh, usually gets pretty good response. Um, and that's uh, that's always popular, and I don't mind like handing it to somebody that has no clue what they're doing. Because I can be like, oh, it's cool, you know, it's, it's a $15 pen, but don't worry about it. Here, try it out, you know, boom, you just like throw it in their hand, and they're willing to give it a shot. Whereas if I have like the Homo sapiens, I don't want to be like, oh yeah, here, just try it. You never written with a fountain pen? Go for it. Um, maybe. 
depending on uh, how respectful I feel that they may be to it. But uh, anyway, um, so that's one, something like in that range, kind of like the starter pen range or like maybe a Jin Hao, like Shimmering Sands or something kind of sparkly and looks kind of cool. They still get the idea, see a big nib, they get the idea of the fountain pen, kind of how it's working, um, but uh, it's not so intimidating. Something like, you know, the unique materials that I kind of alluded to, like um, uh, the Homo sapiens. I'm like, oh yeah, this is this has got a little bit more of a story to it. I'm like, oh yeah, the trim is bronze. It's made in this villa in Italy. The lava stone is from Mount Etna in Florence. And they're just like, what? You know, so I use that as kind of the example of like a little more over the top, kind of holy grail pen kind of status, right? And so that's really cool. And they're like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh yeah, this pen's durable. Like here, pick it up, play with it, stuff like that. And they look at the nib and they're like, whoa, crazy. So that's really kind of cool. So I like to show people kind of a spectrum when I'm dealing with uh, pens and stuff like that. Or um, like something like a decimo or a vanishing point is really cool too, because click pens a lot of people are familiar with from like ballpoints and roller balls and stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, click fountain pen. This is actually one of the few that does that. Here, boom, there you go, check it out, sweet. That's pretty awesome. I'm not always carrying a vanishing point around on me, um, but it's also pretty cool. Uh, and I think that, uh, that'll do it. And then of course, like if I have any fancier pens on me, you know, I'll just be like, what the heck? So if I have like a, um, I didn't even plan on showing this one, but if I've got a, um, Visconti Upper Master Luna, I'll show that one. Or if I want to show like a London Fog or something just really crazy or, um, like anything Machier or Rodden is just crazy because then I can get into like, yeah, there's like 20 to 40 layers of lacquer on here and it takes like four to six months to make these pens. They're just like, what? That's nuts. Um, so that's always pretty cool to, to kind of show people of like, you know, because it's like when, when I talk to people and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm into fountain pens. People don't always have a baseline of what that is. And with me, it's never just like, oh, I'm really into pens. Okay, cool. That's kind of a weird hobby thing. Great. With me, it's always like, oh, I'm into, yeah, I have a pen retail store. So it's like with me, it's never just a, a light conversation. In fact, half the time I try and hide the fact that I do it because if I'm just like, you know, signing a receipt before I leave the store, I don't want to get into a 15 minute conversation because I got to go pick up my kid, right? So I'll kind of use my, my judgment about what's going on. Uh, but if I have some time, sure, I'll get all into it. You know, like when I've talked to like TSA agents at the airport and stuff, that's some of the most interesting conversations I've ever had. I had one person that was like, I was trying to explain a fountain pen and how it worked and they could not wrap their head around what I was talking about. I didn't have it on me because I'd pack my pens away. Uh, but uh, they, um, I was trying to explain, I was like, a fountain pen. No, no, that one that I did show them the pen. I did show them a fountain pen. And they were like, a fountain? Like the pen like comes up through a, through a fountain? Like they were, they were picturing like a water fixture, like a fountain with a pen coming up out of it. And I was like, sure, wh whatever. You know, I like, I had to take my shoes off and my belt and all that stuff. And I was like, yep, you got it. Bingo, that's what I do. Have a great day. You know, uh, but anyway, so uh, sometimes I can get into it a little bit more about that. But um, the, the honest truth is the more I get into it and I tell people like what I do. So I usually end up showing kind of a range if they show interest. Some people are like, oh, OK, whatever. And, you know, and I'm like, great, cool. Here's this one pen. Sure. OK, go on with your day. But if people are showing genuine interest, I'll pull out like four or five pens and just show them what I have going on because they're like, whoa, this is crazy. And I try and show them like, you know, and I know the whole story. So I'm like, oh yeah, check out this Edison pen. It's made in Ohio. And I started working with them like eight years ago and they're nice, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. American made, woo, you know. And then so I'm like, oh yeah, made out of volcano. And they're like, what? That's insane. Um, so I can kind of get into it. And I'm like, oh yeah, we got like 600 different colors of ink and you can get nibs and all different things and you can look calligraphy. And they're like, what? This is insane. I can't believe it. And I'm like, yeah, check out my site. Boom new customer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, pulling people into the rabbit hole, right? Um, I mean, I guess that kind of is my job. So I guess quickly switch into that mode, you know, and just like go into the restaurant or going filling up my car with gas or something. And some, you know, somebody's just kind of hanging out there, strike up a conversation. If they show interest, I get all into it. And it's just, that's the cool thing about fountain pens, you know, it brings people together. Um, anyway, so that's kind of what I got. But the honest truth is, uh, for non fountain pen people, just about any fountain pen is cool. Like you show a preppy or a Jin Hao and that blows most people's minds, uh, just because of it's just, it's a new world that they've never seen before. So that's just super cool. So you don't have to go crazy fancy. Um, you can just get some really interesting conversations going. All right. Let's do a couple more jokes. Shall we? I gotta make sure I kind of pace myself here. Okay. Um, do you want to hear a joke about a broken nib? Never mind. It's pointless. Uh, and what do you call a factory that makes adequate pens? A satisfactory. 
We'll do one more. Uh, did you hear that they're going to have a new outdoor pen show? It's supposed to be intense. Oh, yeah. That just happened. All right. Next question. This is an ink question from Melissa H. on Facebook. I see people so disappointed in missing special edition inks. Hint, hint, Lummy Dark Lilac. With all of the inks currently on the market, it seems colors aren't all that unique anymore. I found many colors that I currently own being replicated by other companies. Perhaps the individual properties of said inks aren't identical, but the colors are so much that I have trouble telling the difference. And I'll turn down a new color that I gravitate towards because I already have that color in a different brand. Do you think... This is a long question. Do you think this will be a problem for ink companies moving forward? Is there anything in terms of something like copyright or trademark violations when it comes to ink colors? Um, so, I mean, sure, it's, it's business, right? Like, so if you have any kind of brand, anything especially that's popular, you could march into trademark or copyright uh, territory there. Not so much just with a color of an ink, because um, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can actually... Uh, trademark a color. You can trademark a name of a color or branding or packaging or something around the color, but you can't say like, I own purple. Purple is my color and anything purple people have to give me the rights. You can't really do that. You know what I mean? Um, so uh, yeah, if somebody comes out with an exactly identical color of ink, it's got a different name, different packaging, different branding, different marketing, all that kind of stuff. It's just another purple ink that looks exactly the dang same. Then yeah, you should be okay. Um, if you um, you know are marketing, like for example, I'm just gonna pull it up and and believe me, I'm not a trademark lawyer or copyright lawyer or anything like that. So if you are one of those, maybe you can let me know in the comments if I'm wrong in any way here, but this is kind of my understanding of it. You know, it's like, uh, I think about like proprietary formulas that are really famous, like, you know, the formula for Coca-Cola, or, um, you know, if you have like a, a scent of a, a cologne or a perfume, or if you have like, a, you know, KFC's chicken recipe and all that kind of stuff. Like they keep them locked up in vaults and you know, all that kind of stuff. You can make stuff that emulates it. You can make stuff that tastes exactly like Coke and you can market it. You can call it Schmoke and uh, maybe that's too close. You can call it whatever, Sam's Cola or something like that. It can taste exactly the same. It can be marketed as a similar product and you're fine. So it's not that like, a fountain pen ink, just because it's a similar color, is really stepping on anybody's toes. And frankly, like from being in the business for a little while, I've never really seen anybody like, for example, Lamy Dark Lilac, right? Purple ink, really hot, came out, sold out, everybody wanted it, couldn't get it. I didn't see anybody else come out with like an, a look-alike, like an exact kind of thing. Like I, th I think, since I mentioned cologne and perfumes, I think about like how you have like whatever famous colognes and perfumes, I don't really know anyway, because I'm not really in that world. Um, but if you have all these famous things and you go to like the dollar store or like, you know, something like that. And it's like, smells like Hugo Boss or whatever. It's like inspired by, you know, it's like they'll eat, and that even is like, mm, kind of borderline. But from like a legal standpoint, I'm sure it's like not worth Hugo Boss's time to sue whatever scented water company is selling their smells like or inspired by cologne. So like you, you're, they're treading probably fine line there. Um, but I've never seen that level of, you know, mimicking or copycatting uh, go on in the fountain pen world, especially related to ink. You know, I've seen it with pens a little bit more of people that like start to cross over some lines and there's some legal stuff that gets interesting behind the scenes with certain companies that are a little too inspired by others. Uh, but I've never really seen that happen with ink. Um, so I think we're generally pretty okay. It's a pretty civil industry in that respect. Um, but I mean, I'm sure if somebody came out with an exact bottle that looks like diamine and it's red dragon and they called it dragon of red and uh it wasn't diamine but it was bliamine uh they might be might be treading into a dangerous territory there uh but i've never seen anybody copy it that closely you know for example like lami dark lilac uh diatromentus aubergine is really close their alexander hamilton's really close you know J.R. Vaughn came out with a 1798 uh amethyst de laurel it's, it's a purple ink that's similar to Dark Lilac, but it's got silver shimmer in it. And it's in a whole different bottle and it's all that. So, and it's a, it's a whole different thing. So yeah, especially with ink colors, it's like how many different black inks are there? There's like 50 of them. And some of them are almost completely indistinguishable from each other. So when you get into the branding and packaging and stuff like that, that's when you gotta be really intentional about trademark and copyright and that kind of stuff. But frankly, I think like just in general, 
the fountain pen, especially the fountain pen ink side of the kind of industry or the world, um, there's just not that much money in it uh, to really warrant a lot of like copying thus legal battles. Like typically when you have, you know, a lot of money in a certain industry, that's when you have a lot of legal trouble. You know, when you have real estate and financial stuff and, you know, like the music industry and athletics and all that, you're going to have legal, you know, Hollywood, you're going to have legal stuff flying everywhere because it gets more subjective as to who owns intellectual property rights and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and there's a lot of money at stake. So people are much more likely to sue. With Fountain Pen Inc., you know, these are small companies across the world to sue somebody internationally for something that's, in, you know, you got a couple hundred bottles or a couple thousand bottles of ink worldwide. It's really not that much in the grand scheme of things. So I've never seen any legal trouble stir up as a result of ink, and I don't know that I ever really will. Uh, and I've never really seen anybody that's blatantly tried to rip it off. So I think we're generally pretty okay. All right, let's do a couple more questions, shall we? Uh, what are the worst fountain pens that are made today? Uh, vacuum fillers because they suck. <laughs> yeah. uh, duck walks into a pen store to get a new pen and says, "Yeah, just put it on my bill." Uh, all right, get all that laughter out. Okay. All right. Next question is from It's Keenan on Instagram. This is a paper question. What is your take on stone paper notebooks? Are they fountain pen friendly? Could they damage pens? Sorry if you've answered this before. I watch every week and I haven't seen it answered as of yet. I have talked about stone paper, but it's been a while. I'll be completely honest with you all after doing 206 of these things. I can't remember what I talked about when, unless I talked about it in like the last two weeks. Even then, it's uh, it's sketchy at best. I don't have the best memory. I'm really like, jealous of people that can remember things that they've done in the past. It is just not a gift of mine, and I apologize. You know, I follow like Gary Vaynerchuk, and I watch things, and he recalls from like two years ago videos that he talked about specific things he said, and I'm like, I just, I just don't, I can't, no, I just can't even. So it's just not my, it's not my gift. Uh, but anyway, I know I've talked about stone paper, but I thought it might be worth to bring it out again because I do get asked about it from time to time. It's not a lot that I see stone paper around. Uh, basically what stone paper is, uh, from what I understand, I'm not like super well studied on it, but basically it's it's kind of like a plastic paper that has a, a coating, uh, for lack of a better term, of really fine stone powder. So it's not actually completely made of stone. Uh, but the advantage you have with this kind of paper is it's waterproof, right? It's very, very durable. Uh, and that's kind of cool and kind of interesting with the right type of understanding of what's going on. Um, so this, uh, I actually don't even have a notebook with stone paper in it. Uh, my stone paper experience is limited to this two sheets of paper that was sent to me by a fan uh, a couple of years ago. I tested it a little bit. Uh, and that's kind of what I, I have. So uh, this paper, it's pretty interesting. It's very, it feels very, it almost feels like suede or like leathery uh, because it just doesn't feel like regular paper. Um, when, you're, when you have your nib on it, you feel a little bit of drag. It actually feels smoother to the touch in your fingers than it does on the pen. Kind of like if you have um, mylar paper, right? Like for any of you that have like tuned your own nibs or anything like that, um, this is a plastic sheet with an abrasive on it. It kind of feels like that, except maybe even feels slightly more abrasive, and it probably is. Um, because essentially what you're dealing with here is it's kind of like a mylar paper or like a micro mesh. Um, feels kind of leathery as well. You're essentially what it is, it's like an abrasive paper. So for something like a ballpoint or rollerball pen, it's not that big of a deal because the, the ball is actually rolling as you're writing. So it gives a little friction, actually makes it feel really smooth. Fountain pen, your nib is in like one fixed place. And as you're writing, you're essentially smoothing your nib as you're writing much more aggressively than you would on regular paper. So for me, I don't like the experience just because it's got a little more drag to it for one. The ink performance is meh, kind of okay with certain inks, um, not as okay with certain others. I'll zoom in so you can see writing samples that I and my team have done. So I used one that was a, um, I used a Diplomat pen, it was a fine nib. So that was a steel nib with Diamond Ox Blood. Um, and actually my pen didn't didn't write as well. It felt a little scratchier after I wrote even just this sample. Uh, Noodler's Conrad, so a flex pen with Burma Road Brown, which is uh, one that Drew loves, but I actually talked about it in, uh, in uh, right now on Wednesday. 
And uh, so, you know, it kind of loses a lot of color. It doesn't really shade well. Um, this is Nidler, what is this, Diamond Purple Pizzazz. So um, it really loses a lot of its, uh, a lot of its shimmer. Uh, let's see here, Orochizuku Kanpeki actually feathers quite a bit. So it's like, it looks okay with certain inks, like Oxblood it looks all right. Um, I don't know what this in is. <laughs> Aloha, you friggin' surfers, I think is what that says. Uh, but um, make sure that this all says appropriate things. I think we're good. Uh, but it just doesn't look great, you know, with most of these inks. And, you know, given that, given the fact that it's kind of like roughing up the nibs, given the fact it's not really widely available, I'm just not like super in love with stone paper. Just, I mean, it's interesting, it's different, it's kind of neat. And if you're using it in like a, a scenario where you're gonna be around a lot of water, if you're by the ocean or something like that, uh, it can be okay, but it's just really not 100% ideal for fountain pens, in my opinion. But that's just, that's just one guy's opinion. So um, I would say if you're gonna do that, uh, maybe just kind of stick to a cheaper pen, a pen that maybe has a replaceable nib just in case you end up kind of going through your nibs a little faster. Be aware that that could very well be the case with stone paper. But with that said, I haven't used stone paper very extensively. So I would be really curious in the comments if you could just leave, if you use stone paper on a regular basis, let me know. Uh, I would love to be a little better educated about that. Um, it's just not something I've uh, become super educated about personally because none of the paper brands that we carry, carry stone paper. So uh, I tested it a little bit, wasn't in love with it, so I didn't really want to test it much further, but uh, I'd love to be smarter, know a little more. Okay, I'm just checking my audio up here, we're good. All right, next, a couple more jokes. Um, I have an entire drawer filled with pen caps. They look so lonely there, mainly because they have no body. I keep looking for camouflage pens, but I can't seem to find any. All right, next question is a troubleshooting question. <clears throat> this is from Lot O'Colton on Twitter. I have a Goulet or Yovo Extra Fine Steel Nib on a Jinhao X450. I've had it several years, and recently it's taken to ripping paper when I pull from left to right. I'm right-handed. Right to left is still smooth. Talk about toothy. How can I fix it? Micromesh? Thanks for all y'all do. You're very welcome. Um, okay, so uh, ripping the paper, I would say, is beyond toothy. Uh, that's scratchy. So I think you've kind of crossed over into that territory. And I actually have had a couple of questions in the last two weeks about like, how do you know when scratchy, uh, you're like where the line is between toothy and scratchy. To me, that's when you start cutting paper. I think that's a pretty clear, pretty definitive thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, you can have toothy and it feels kind of bad, but it's not actually affecting the paper. When you're affecting the paper and it's like pulling up paper fibers, you're leaving a line, you're cutting the paper, that's scratchy. Now everybody's gonna have a different definition of it. That's to me, that just seems like a very clear place to be able to make that distinction to, you know, to each his own. Um, so something's not right here. Uh, you've had your pen for several years. It hasn't always been doing this. Something happened to it, right? Like it doesn't just all of a sudden, like the nib decides that it wants to start writing scratchy. Something has happened to that nib. Either it was dropped or it was, you know, tweaked by some something. Somebody wrote with it weird and it pressed and knocked it out of alignment. Or it could be that over time, as you've been writing with it, I've seen this happen before. I don't know what several years means to you and, and how much you've exclusively been using this pen. If you've been using it pretty aggressively several years, um, like on a daily basis and writing with it, it could be that you've kind of worn a little bit of a flat spot in the tipping material. I mean, this it's pretty hardened metal on the tips of these nibs, but over a number of years with really regular use, it's possible that you could actually wear through the tipping on the nib. Um, not to say you need to like throw the nib out at that point, but it does need to be reshaped a little bit. Um, so you have one of two things is going on. You either have an alignment issue or you've like worn a flat spot. And uh, when that happens, if you wear a flat spot, that means when you are turning it in a certain orientation, you could be catching kind of a sharper edge than than what used to be there. It's not a nice perfectly round ball on the tip anymore. You know, if you got this round ball and then you've kind of worn a flat spot out of it, then unless it's perfectly flat on the page, if you're rotating it in your hand just a little bit, which you could very well be doing without even realizing it, um, then you have like a, this little edge right on, on these parts and it could just kind of catch just a little bit, just a little bit, it might feel toothy. Um, but still, if it's ripping paper, that to me sounds a little bit more like an alignment issue. 
So your alignment of your tines, so imagine you're looking straight at the nib. So I'm taking your pen, this is an X450, right? And taking it and I'm turning it towards myself like this, like I'm gonna stab myself in the eye. So if I turn that towards you, imagine that, that I'm, you know, I'm gonna stab you in the eye. Don't, I'm not actually going to, it's okay, don't duck. Um, for you and listening in the audio podcast, I don't know why I'm waving up at the microphone up here as if you can see me, you can't, but there's a microphone right above me that I'm pointing to right now. <laughs> If you're listening to me in the audio podcast, then uh, this will get this will get challenging to describe to you. But um, you have the tines, which are my arms, right? My hands, which are balled up, uh, are making the, the tip of the nib, right? And you've got the slit that's cut down here. That's the space between my two arms. So what happens when there's a misalignment issue is one of the tines is lower than the other. And what happens when you're writing, so I think your left tine, which is the one right here, is drop down. And what's happening when you're writing from left to right is it's pulling across the paper. That edge is catching. And this could be a combination of you've written with it for several years. Maybe there's a little bit of a flat spot and you have an alignment issue. Now you've got a nice little edge there and it's catching. Um, and, and it's not happening when you're going from left to right because this one here, this tine, is actually the one that's kind of the leading edge. So it, you're not going to feel it as much. So that's why, to me, this seems like more of an alignment issue. If it's scratchy and you have like a flat spot or something like that, you're going to feel that more consistently in, in multiple directions. Uh, if you're feeling it more in one direction than the other, that's usually an alignment issue. Um, so that's when I usually know it's time to bust out the loop. And I have, uh, I need to redo my loop video. It's, it's a little old, but you know, I'll go ahead and show you here. So you take the pen and you hold it as if you're going to stab yourself in the eye. Take the loop and you kind of hold it up like this. And then you get that pen kind of in focus here. And then you look at it and you can usually see if your tine is dropped down a little bit below the other. And if it is, all you gotta do is take your thumb, um, just like the your fingernail on your thumb, and you just push up a little bit. And let me try and, you know, I'm gonna see if I can get really close in and show you this, just to really add some value in the Q&A here today. Let me zoom in really, 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 really super good. Let's see how close I can get, boom. Okay, now I have the original Jinhao nib on here. I don't have a Goulet one, but it's the same concept, right? So if you're looking through here, I'm gonna see if I can even hold it. This is gonna get wacky. I'm gonna hold the loop up on here. Ooh, that's actually not, it's actually not terrible. Okay, I'm making myself a little dizzy. Not too terrible. Okay, oh God. I'm, I'm trying to get the nib focused in on the loop. Okay, well, you can see it's somewhat there, but it's kind of hard to show it from this far away, but you get the idea. You can see the, the nib in there. Um, and what's happening, it's actually kind of easier to do it without this. Um, say the, the alignment is off uh, and it's gonna look kind of whacked out like that. Mm. So if the alignment's off, that's a super extreme example right there. Um, but it, that's an example of what it looks like if it's really, really, really off. And that's gonna feel really scratchy in one direction. So really all you need to do is take the time that's a little lower, you take your thumb with the fingernail and you just push it up on the, the lower time, right? So you push up, over bend it a little bit, check it again, make sure that it's aligned. Push up, push up, push up, and then make sure that it's aligned. And you keep looking through that loop until it's aligned. And then once it's aligned, it should write way better. And really that's the whole process. If that's not the case, if it's aligned and it's still writing scratchy, then it could be that there's a couple that you need to smooth it out a little bit. Um, one of the first things that I like to do when I'm smoothing it, you can use micro mesh or honestly a mylar paper if you have, whichever you have. Mylar paper is going to be finer. It's it's a little better to, to use that, but if it's really really scratchy, micro mesh can help. Um, one trick that I like to do is I take my finger. And um, so think about it. if it's scratchy left to right, that means the left tine is the one that's dragging. If you're looking down like at the surface of the nib, the tine that's on the left, that's the one that's dragging. So what you do is you lift up the opposite tine, the right one, so that your left one is kind of hanging down further. You take the micro mesh or the mylar and you just nick the inside a little bit. So basically the part of the tine that would be touching the paper um, you're just rounding it off a little bit kind of on the inside where it would be kind of joining up with the other side of the nib You just kind of go like that a couple of times and that's just gonna round over that edge a little bit And honestly half the time that's gonna fix your problem You can go a little more aggressive once it's aligned you can do like some little figure eights You can do some kind of just like 
little tick marks like this on the micro mesh to just kind of smooth it out in general. And, and really the best way to do it is to kind of, you know, go like these little marks and make sure that you're kind of like rotating the pen in your hand as you're doing it to kind of smooth it out evenly around the roundness of the nib. If you just do it in one place and go back and forth, you're gonna end up wearing a flat spot on your nib. You don't want that. Um, you want to kind of move it around a little bit. But honestly, if it's if it's really cutting that much, the majority of the time, I feel like it's that inside edge on that nib that's actually catching. And uh, that might be enough to do it for you. And worst case, if, if you mess around, and if you're using a Goulet nib, that's a nice nib because it's a good nib, it's worth trying to fix it. But honestly, if you do it and you totally botch it, you can get a replacement and it's not the end of the world. Um, Gin House are good for practicing that too because it's a not a super expensive pen. Noodler's nibs are great too because they're like two bucks and uh, you can play around on those. But I think, uh, I think that will uh, help you out quite a bit. All right, got a few more jokes here to close out before I have one, I have one more question. Um, but before I do, you know, it's interesting. I was talking about the nib smoothing stuff. I was actually considering becoming a nibmeister, uh, but I heard it's a real grind. And did you hear about the man who stole a planner? Yeah, he got 12 months. Uh, speaking of planners, you know, I've thought about just discontinuing selling planners because, you know, their days are numbered. And I got one more, but I'm going to save it for after I do my last question. Um, the last one I have here this week is, uh, it's a personal question from Spider7006 on Instagram. What book will you make your children read before they graduate high school? I thought that was a really interesting question. Uh, assuming my kids graduate high school, uh, all signs indicate towards that happening, but you know, you just never know. No judgment to our folks out there who um, have, you know, uh, different paths in life. Uh, more power to you. Uh, anyway, uh, assuming that my kids do, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm a pretty practical person and I'm pretty like, business-minded, obviously. That's why I do what I do. Uh, I'm not a big novel reader, so while I fully respect literature and art and like all that stuff, creative writing and things like that, it's just not a personal interest of mine. So I, f I feel like it would be great if I was like, yeah, there's a really, you know, classic literature works that like, you know, uh, Emerson or, you know, Robert Frost or whatever, you know, like they should read this kind of stuff. That would be great, but I'm just, I'm just not that guy. I'm just not. The stuff that I read is like finance books, business books, leadership, personal development. That's just where I'm at. So uh, my kids are going to get plenty of that just because a lot of that's going to rub off because I'm in it all the time. Uh, I, I think personally, one of the things I'm, I'm a little more passionate about as a parent, specifically as a parent, I'm going to encourage my kids to read all that stuff, get involved in that get involved in, in as much of that kind of uh, literature and creative stuff as they're interested with other people. I just know I'm not gonna be the one to like lead the way there. Uh, where I will be able to really uh, impact them, I feel, is kind of living by example. Cause you know, they say like more is caught than taught, right? As a parent. So if I like try and say like, oh, you should read Moby Dick, but they never see me ever reading literature, they're gonna be like, why is this important at all, you know? Um, and so I feel like that's, uh, I don't wanna be a hypocrite. So, um, but if I'm talking about like the self-improvement business stuff, my parent, my kids are gonna be like, oh yeah, this is like legit. Like he read these books and they've changed his life. Um, so the one, probably the one that I think I would really like my kids to read, and I haven't even talked to Rachel about this, uh, and I'm not like gonna be super ridiculous about it, but I've kind of already started to incorporate some of these principles, is uh, Financial Peace by Dave Ramsey. Um, so Dave Ramsey, for what it's worth, he can be somewhat of a controversial figure for some of you based on your beliefs, uh, but just purely looking at his financial principles, it's pretty rock solid. And he takes on kind of a controversial stance of like no debt, don't have credit cards, some of that stuff, which is very countercultural to where we're at, especially in America today. Uh, however, what I can say is that some of the principles that he talks about in there are really good for explaining the things to kids that just aren't taught in school. Just like, you know, how to feel your money and make decisions and there's some principles in that book like don't invest in something that you don't completely understand so like there's principles from that they're gonna like help keep my kids from like getting conned and getting scammed and like utilizing common sense and he breaks down some specific things about just like 
typical financial instruments like what is whole life insurance and what is a 401k? Some of these types of things that like, they really, you know, everybody talks about like, oh, they should really teach this stuff in school, but they don't really largely. You know, that's the kind of stuff where like, I know as a parent, that's one of the most practical and useful things I'm gonna be able to teach my kids uh, before they're like, you know, you say specifically before they graduate high school, that's like when you're an adult and you can vote, you can serve in the military, you are voting for, uh, you know, our future leaders, you are a contributing member of society, you can sign contracts, you're, you're in it. You're in the society, in the world. Uh, and I'm like, what are some of the things that I can put in place for to set them up for success in that way? You know, being able to understand these types of concepts of like how to handle money, how to budget, how to make decisions and just like, you know, especially regarding your money. It's like, I know a lot of really smart people who just have a harder life because they make really stupid decisions around money. So I think if I can instill some of that in my kids, that will at least give them somewhat of a foundation to then have some options. Cause I think that like, man, just the college debt and just the, some of the debt that's out there with our younger generation right now is outright scary. That's part of why I'm a little debt averse, even though I'm a millennial and you know, yeah, YOLO, living your best life. Sure, that all sounds great. But man, I see some stuff out there from a macro level of like what's going on, especially in the US of just like, yikes, what is gonna look like here in the future? So as a parent, I'm kind of passionate about like teaching my kids to think for themselves and not just kind of go along with what society kind of tells them. But like, sure, like, it's not like I'm an anti-college and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I have a college degree, but my parents drilled into me like, don't, like if you can graduate without debt because that's gonna set you up with so many more options. And yeah, if I had been riddled with debt when I graduated college, I would not have been able to turn down the commercial real estate job that I was offered to go power wash houses with my dad. I made way less money to power wash houses with my dad. I would not have been able to do that if I had a $400 to $500 a month college loan payment hanging over my head. That would not have been an option for me. Thus, I would not have been able to have the time and the ability to then explore Goulet Pens in its current form. Now I could have still done that in maybe a different way, but it just would have changed some things for me. So I wanna pass that on to my kids and I think that um, is kind of cool to be able to uh, do that. So I'm thinking about that even at this young age. And there's another book called Smart Bunny, Smart Kids that Dave Ramsey wrote with his daughter, Rachel Cruz. That's kind of a cool because it talks about like, not only Dave Ramsey been talking about like how to handle money for 25, 30 years, but his daughter who's now in the business with him is now teaching her own stuff, talks about what it was like for her as a kid of Dave Ramsey to then like, so you get both perspectives of the parent and the kid. And there's some cool stuff in there. Like even like when you're paying your kids for doing their chores or jobs or whatever, whatever you call them, just like, you know, he talks about like, yeah, we didn't, you know, we, we set to do it every week, but he's like 25% of the time we missed it. But then like Rachel was like, yeah, that just, I never was aware that they missed it. You know, I just know that we got paid regularly. And so it's like just understanding like, it's okay if it's not perfect, but just the approach. So it's kind of cool there. And I've actually incorporated some of the, like the way that we uh, teach our kids how to do chores and stuff around the house um, and the way that we pay them for those, uh, for the, we call them jobs. Um, so that we pay them to do these jobs. And like my daughter is six years old. She cannot wait to empty the trash can. Anytime the trash can needs to be emptied or we have dishes that need to be washed or the table needs to be set, she is like, you know, she'll be like playing iPad or something like that. And I'm like, oh, Ellie, can you, you know, does anybody want to help set the table? We pay them like a quarter to set the table. Uh, and we largely like don't buy them toys really, except for like birthdays and special events, Christmas and stuff like that. Um, but just normal stuff, like we don't really buy them a lot, but we pay them to do stuff. Uh, and then we let them buy their own stuff. So that they're feeling like I work, I get paid, I save, I earn, I give, I, you know, and they're teaching that even from an early age. Cause I'm like, yeah, if we teach them from an early age, they'll just never know the difference that there's an alternative option. So anyway, super long answer on that one. And I'm gonna close out this week before I do the question of the week with a final, a final um, uh, pen joke. Uh, this one is uh, for all of you uh, people who like new pens out there. Uh, did you hear about the new apocalypse pen? Uh, yeah, they're selling like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> so most of these jokes were heavily adapted from other dad jokes and I just kind of inserted fountain pen things into them. You've probably heard several versions of them in other ways elsewhere, but it had kind of fun uh, splicing them together. Question of the week for this week. 
is uh, going back to a question that I answered earlier. Uh, what pen do you have that tends to attract the most attention from your non fountain pen colleagues? Uh, if you have one, if you have a bunch of you carry around or just in general, or maybe you're like, yeah, everybody thinks I'm a weirdo and nobody likes my fountain pens. Uh, just let me know kind of what you think in the comments. I would love to hear some of your stories and just what pens uh, people who don't know anything about pens are kind of most interested in, especially if you're like, yeah, I carry this pen around because, you know, I've actually recruited several of my friends into the fountain pen uh, lifestyle because of this pen. So yeah, that would be just really interesting for me to know. Uh, and I would love to hear your story. Uh, that's it for this week. I am actually going to be taking off next week. Uh, Rachel and I are um, going to be, our kids have spring break, so they're off anyway. Uh, and so we're going to be um, hanging out with family for the whole week. Uh, I'll be not super accessible on like an emergency basis for my team, but I will not be participating in right now is next week and I will not be we're still going to have them but I won't be in them so that'll be something a new little twist uh, and next week I won't do a regular Q&A but in fact I had David Parker from Figboot on Fens visit last week and uh, we recorded a video that we're going to publish next week in absence of Q&A so you can look forward to that uh, and then at some point we'll have the Lamy video too so and uh, there's a couple other uh, videos that are in the works too that should be kind of fun so anyway lots of good stuff going on I hope you all have a happy Easter if you are in to that and uh, I hope you uh, you know get all of the Easter eggs that you desire and uh, <laughs> hope you have a great weekend and a great rest of your week and right on. Mm -hmm.